So welcome, everybody, uh, to Google I.O. first session in the morning. Um, my name is Sven Mawson. I'm going to be talking to you about some of the new stuff we've been working on uh, the Google Data Protocol. I'm a member of the Google, Google Data APIs team. So the thing we're concerned with today is how to build more efficient applications. Um, how many of you guys are familiar, first of all, with the Google Data APIs and have used them? So a fair number, OK. Um, for those of you that haven't, I'm going to give a quick background. The Google Data APIs are a set of APIs that are based on some common standards like Atom Pub, the Atom, Atom Publishing Protocol, um, and Atom, and then RSS we also support, and uh, we support some JSON. Uh, this set of APIs is supported by many, many Google services, including YouTube, um, Picasso Web Albums, Calendar, Docs, et cetera. There's many, many of them. Um, you can find the whole list at code.google.com slash APIs slash gdata. So for more information on that. So the sort of starter question is, what kind of applications are we talking about that we're that we're worried about efficiency? Well, of course, the, the answer is every application should be worried about efficiency, right? Um, everything costs money. So the faster your application is, the, the more users you'll get, um, the more your users will be happy, you know, the more money you'll save on bandwidth, all kinds of stuff. So within that, there actually are some sets of applications that this matters even more than others. For example, mobile applications really, really need efficiency because they're limited by their bandwidth, they're limited by latency, they're limited by the memory on the, on the client. So everything really matters there. And AJAX applications in general are also very sensitive to efficiency. So what kind of things can we do to, to, to make them more efficient? Um, the first thing we can do, of course, is to reduce the number of requests. So the, the, less, the less round trips you make to the server, the faster your application is going to be. Another thing you can do is to reduce the bandwidth. Um, the, the less uh, wire wire size your requests are taking, the quicker the server will be able to respond, the quicker your application will work, the less money your users will spend on bandwidth if they're, actually, if they're mobile users and, and they actually pay for bandwidth, um, and the, the less money you'll pay for bandwidth if you're using, for example, App Engine and you pay by bandwidth. So bandwidth is very important, and of course, latency is also very important. So reducing the amount of time between making a request and getting the response back. Any way you can reduce that, your users will be happy and you'll be happy. OK, so I'm going to show a quick little demo of something I built called Photo Shuffle. It's a um, very, very simple app engine app on photoshuffle.appspot.com if you want, want to look at it. The source is actually just an HTML page, so if you want to look at the source, just go to it and view source, and, and there it is. It doesn't use anything exciting, so here it is. Um, it asks for a username in the, the Picasso Web Album service, so I'm going to use a um, username I created for today and click Load Albums, and it loads up all your albums from Picasso Web Albums using the Google Data API. Um, this is actually running, this version is running using all the stuff I'm going to talk about today, so it's actually pretty fast. Um, if it was not running with the stuff I'm talking about today, it would be a bit slower, but for example, this, this Photos from Yosemite album is, um, I think, 500 photos, so you can see it loaded all of these very, very quickly, um, and that's all because of the stuff I'm going to be talking about today. So. The, the application is called Photo Shuffle because I added this button that lets you shuffle. So it just moves the photos around. Not very exciting, but it's, you know, it's an Ajax app. It loads data using the APIs. It does what it's supposed to do. Um, you, know, you can load up a different album. It'll shuffle those. This is from the Tour of California that, that was in the area recently. OK, so that's the, that's, that's the little demo application. Um, let's quickly take a look back at sort of what the Google Data APIs had uh, before this. So how many of you guys have used the JSON output of the Google Data APIs that we have right now? So a, a fair number, but you know, may maybe that was a, a sixth, seventh, not too many. OK, so a quick background. The, the way we set up our JSON output was as a direct translation of the XML. So this is an XML to JSON back to XML uh, translation conversion. And the reason we did this is for read-write support. So if you have um, an Atom Publishing Protocol API, like the Google Data APIs, you, you support full round trips of reading data, modifying it, writing it back to the server. Um, instead of having to support parsing of the JSON, all we support is outputting JSON, and then on the client, we can convert that JSON back to XML and send that back to the server for an update. So that's why we did things the way we did it. 
although it's, it's not that great. So here's, here's an example of a conversion. See the XM on the left, the JSON on the right? It looks very, very similar. Um, we just replace things around a little bit. You know, there's the media content. It's easy to see how you can convert back and forth between them. So what we did is any XML element, we just take and turn it directly into a JSON object. So there are the elements. Um, every single one is an object in our current, in our current JSON format. It's pretty inefficient. Um, attributes are a little bit nicer. They're just JSON properties. So we have an attribute like the URL, the type, medium. Those are all translated directly across. And then when you send it back to the server, it's translated back the other direction. So it's very simple. The other thing we had to do is because in XML you have, you have attributes and you have elements, but the elements themselves also have content. Um, so elements can have content and attributes and child elements, although the combination isn't really supported. But so what we had to do is whenever you have text content, we had to have a special property called $t that stores the text content of that. So here's an example of the media credit. Um, the content of that element is a property on the media credit object called $t. So it's, it's a direct translation. It's about the same size. It's not that exciting. Um, so this is what that photo shuffle application looks like when you're using that JSON. So that application I just showed, this is the, the code from it. This is how you would load up data using a script tag. So how many people are familiar with using script tags for loading data? OK, so uh, that's more than have used our JSON. Um, anyway, this is what you do. You, you create a script tag. You stick it in the head. Um, you set the source of it to your script source. In this case, we're using the uh, Picasso Web Albums data API with the username that I typed into that box. Um, and, then I'm, and then I'm getting the JSON alt format and the callback I just called callback for simplicity. So here's that callback. This is what, so what happens is you load that script. It goes to the server, it gets the data, it comes back, and that callback gets called with, with your data. So this callback will get called with it. We have to pull out the albums from it, which are in data.feed.entry. We loop through those, and we call this method addAlbum, which we see here. And here's where things get kind of ugly. Um, to get the ID of the album, we have to do entry.gphoto.id.t. So that, that dollar sign notation that um, we saw earlier is actually for XML namespace support. So we actually have that gphoto is actually an XML namespace alias, and we include in the response the, the XML namespaces. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But um, there's a couple important things here. One is that the, to get the feed link, which so the way that the API is structured, you get the albums, and then each entry in that feed has a link to the list of photos in that feed. So that's that link there. And it happens to be the, the first link. But the actual right way to do this would be to loop through the links, looking for the one with the rel value of feed, and pulling that one out and getting its href. But um, this is a lot easier just to do an array index. Of course, it would break if the server ever returned things in different order. But we, we know for a fact that many people have applications coded this way, so we actually won't change the order. But it's really not ideal to do things this way, and you, you probably shouldn't if you were coding JSON. But today I'm getting out to a much better way to do this anyway. So uh, the other sort of thing to notice is how long and ugly that album thumbnail um, sort of dereferencing is. It's a media dollar group, a media dollar thumbnail, which is an array, and then you have to get the URL. It's, it's just kind of a, kind of a pain. So we need to make this better. So let's, let's quickly just go over all of the reasons why this isn't that great. The first problem is you're creating way too many objects. This isn't as much of a problem on some of the modern browsers, but older browsers had huge problems if you created a lot of JavaScript objects. So it's really good to reduce those. And a lot of people still use those. So um, we want to reduce that. And it's really not that great that we're creating all of these objects. So in this example, we have one, two, three, four, five different objects. And some of them just, you know, the media credit, all it has is a dollar T with, with the credit in there. It's not very exciting. There's, you know, it doesn't look like there should be a reason to actually do that. But because we had to do a complete XML to JSON and back again, that was necessitated. So another problem is, of course, I touched on this earlier, how, how ugly that uh, programming was. So, you know, here's getting the ID, here's getting that image. It's, it's really not fun. The other big problem is that we send a lot of stuff that really is completely unnecessary. So this is actually the JSON, even though we're sending things that look like XML, right? So this is like the XML version, the XML encoding, all the XML namespaces. Do you really need that stuff? No, you don't. But 
we send it anyway just because that's, you know, it's a direct translation. So it just, in the end, takes up way too much space. So here's the, uh, the atom and the atom compared to the JSON, and you can see they're actually exactly the same. Uh, one thing to note on this, if you're not using gzip compression on your, on your request to the server, you should be because it's a factor of uh, about 20 there that it makes it much, much smaller. So first thing you should do, make sure you're getting gzip to request and responses, and if you're not, find out why, because it's huge. Um, but even when compressed, they compress about the same. So there's really no difference there. So we can do better than that. So now I want to introduce something called JSONC to you guys. And this is a clean, compact, and customizable JSON format. So one of the goals that we had was to minimize the number of JavaScript objects, to reduce, reduce that. Um, and there's many ways that we do that. One thing, we have, we have sort of a, a set of standard rules and then we can customize beyond that, but I'm gonna go over the standard rules here. The first is, for things that are simple single elements, and by that I mean an element that just has a single attribute or that just has text content and is not repeating, there's only one of them. It's really easy to translate that into something much better than we were doing. So we were doing the, the thing on the left there, which is to create an object and then have a dollar T, but why not just output it directly as the credit with the name. I mean, much simpler, so that's what we're doing. And the reason we can get away with this is that we know on the server that that element will never have additional attributes. It will never have foreign elements under it. We, we know, because we're the ones writing the code, what it's going to have and what it's not going to have. So we can actually say, okay, that we can output this as a property. It's really simple. So we do that for uh, those, those simple single elements. But what about for complex elements, elements that have maybe a couple attributes and a text content, right? So we can actually get rid of the object there too. What we do is actually pull the additional attributes up next to the, uh, the property. So you have, where before you had a summary object with text and a type attribute, now we have a summary and a summary type. So it's very simple. It makes it much easier to use. It gets rid of an object and it saves space on the wire. So it's pretty nice. Um, things get a little bit more complicated when you start talking about repeating elements because in XML, when something repeats, it just, you just see multiple of them. There's nothing exciting there. In JSON, when something repeats, you have to actually wrap them all in an array. So you have to know ahead of time what is repeating and what is not. But of course, again, we're on the server, we know these things. Um, we can make some, make some things a little bit nicer. So something like um, this keywords element where, where it only has text content, it doesn't have anything else, we can just create a, a simple array for you. So, you know, keywords, Google, I.O., exactly like you'd expect. This is the kind of JSON you probably want to use. Much nicer. What about when you have complex repeating elements? So this is where things um, fall apart in this model. You can't actually come up with any standard set of rules where you, know, you can, can automatically convert these, these um, complex repeating elements into, into a nice JSON format. So here's where the customization comes in. So for something like the links element, we actually completely customize the output. And this is what I was also what I was saying about how using that array notation is bad, but we have something better. So before you had an array of links, and they each had a bunch of, of attributes. They had the rel value, which tells you, you know, the name of it, and then they had a type, which tells you what the, the MIME type will be, and then they actually had the href. In this case, the edit link on the, on the feed we're looking at will always be of type application atom XML. So actually sending that to you is, is completely useless. We don't need to do that. So we can just throw that away, and then the other thing we can do is we can take that rel value and actually make that the name of the link rather than making there be a property for that. And then the href, we use the value of that property. So now we just have a links object with edit equals whatever. And all of those other links will show up as named properties. So to dereference it, you just do links.edit rather than find the link with the rel value of edit and then get the href. So it's much nicer. And this is what we do for these complex, complex repeating elements. And actually, we customize some other things too. So it's very customizable. Here's, here's a complete example. You can see this, this is the media group element within an entry. For example, a Picasso Web Albums photo. Um, you have that, that media group. It had a media content. It had a media credit, media description. There were, um, when I say five objects, now there's just one object. It just has a bunch of properties. You just do entry.media. whatever you want, and it's there. Much nicer to use. The other thing we can do is actually get rid of some more of that data that wasn't useful. So I talked about that edit link where the, the type was, you know, we didn't need it. 
So we, we can do the same kind of thing in other places. The content medium in this case, always image, throw that away. The description type, always plain, throw it away. So we can make things a lot easier. Now we're down to four properties, one object, really simple to use, kind of what we want to do. All right, so let's see this in action. Let's uh, take a look at that, that code that we had for the Photoshop application, and let's change it, change it to use this new JSON form. So all you do is change from alt equals JSON to alt equals JSONC, and then you're gonna get that back. Of course, the model that you get back, those JSON objects have changed, so you have to go change how you dereference that data. So when we, when we get that result back, rather than having a wrapper element and then the feed and then the entries, we got rid of that wrapper element, so it's just a feed and its entries. So rather than data.feed.entry, you just do data. Well, you would do entry, but we made it even nicer, and we actually named it based on what it is. It's albums, so we named it albums. So you just do data albums. Um, the other thing that gets um, into it a little bit more is when you're actually processing those albums. As you can see on the on the right there, all the things are much nicer to look at. So before we had that G photo dollar ID with the namespaces and the dollar T, it's just entry dot ID. The links, as I mentioned before, it's just links dot feed, and then the thumbnails is also simpler. It's it's media dot thumbnails. So thing, things have gotten a lot, a lot nicer to use. And of course, the bandwidth has gone way down. So you can see in the uncompressed case, uh, the bandwidth's about half. In the compressed case, it's about, about two thirds. And the, the uncompressed is actually still important to look at because that's the memory that's gonna be used by the browser after it decompresses the feed. So that's actually what, it's gonna, what the, the browser is gonna be using for memory. Um, so that's also important. So it's, it's good that we have both of those going much, much smaller. Another thing we can look at is the request time. So how long did the request actually tape, take? And this is actually from my house with a really slow internet connection, not from here, which you saw it, you know, it took on the order of maybe 600 milliseconds. Um, at my house, it takes four seconds with the JSON. With the JSON-C, it takes uh, roughly two and three quarters or so. So the request is faster and the parsing time is faster. Um, this is in Firefox 3, which is actually a pretty fast parser, but even in that, you can see there's, there's an improvement. On, on older browsers, which I didn't actually get a chance to test on something like IE6 or Firefox 2 even, this would be uh, even more significant just because they took so much time to parse. Okay, so that was, that was JSON-C and how you'd use it in the, the Photoshop folder. And now I wanna touch on another thing we're introducing, which we call partial get. So to understand this, um, first we have to go into a little background on how REST does updates. So how, how updating an entry works in REST to understand sort of why things work this, the way they do right now and, and how we're gonna change that. So right now when you want to do a read, modify, write cycle, the first thing you have to do is get that whole document. And, and in REST, each URL, each URL represents a document. In our, cases, in our case, they're entries, but um, you can think of it as you know, you're updating an entire document at once. So you, you, get, you get the entry you want to update. In this case, we're, we're doing a get on feeds, my feed, my entry. Um, the important things to notice here are the edit link. So the edit link has an additional piece of information appended to it, which is a version string, and that lets us do optimistic concurrency, which we'll see in a second. But we need, that, we need to use that edit link when we're, when we're updating the entry and then it's gonna have a title, and then it's gonna have a bunch of other fields. And let's say all we wanna do is change the title. Unfortunately, we're operating at the level of documents, not at the level of XML. So we actually need to save all of that stuff, because we're sending entire documents back and forth. We're not actually just sending fields. So we, no matter what that other junk is, we actually need to keep track of it, unfortunately. So then once we have this data, we need to change the fields that we actually want to modify. So let's say we just wanna change the title of the favorite picture leave everything else alone. Then we need to put that back to the server using that edit link. So we do a put to that link. You can see that, that version string at the end there with that new title and all those other fields we had. So we need to include everything again. Now, unfortunately, sometimes someone else may have changed that element at the same time, that entry at the same time you were, which means the server will return a 409 conflict. And it will, it will be a little bit nice and return the new entry for you. It will return that new document. So you don't have to do a whole read, modify, write again. You just do the modify, write. But it's still kind of a pain. You get that, you see in this case, 
the title actually didn't change, and that was all we, we cared about. We just wanted to change the title. The title didn't change, but we still need to go through this whole conflict resolution. Um, the edit link changed because there was a new version, and maybe the summary changed, but everything else was the same. So it's kind of annoying that we have to go through all this just to be able to update a single field. And the reason this actually matters in terms of gets in general is all gets in the Google Data APIs need to support update. So you can't just ask for some small subset of what you want. You have to ask for the whole thing until now. So we're introducing something we call partial get. And you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you might get what you need. OK, so, so what a partial get does is it allows the clients to actually ask for exactly what they want and nothing else, just the key part. So what, what we did is we added a query parameter called the fields query parameter that lets you say exactly what you want. So in this first case, you have a, f a feed. You want the ID, title, and entries in that feed. And in the second case, this is a request for a particular entry, not a whole feed of entries. You just want the ID, title, the media group, and the GRSS where. And this is actually the request for the Atom version of that, of that entry in that feed. So those fields are actually relative to the Atom names of things. So there's actually, it's media colon group because that's, that's what you'd be getting back as the name of that field. And we'll see when we look at this for JSON, it actually uses the JSON names. So, but what if, what if you actually want to specify, you know, that you only want the IDs and title of those entries within the, that feed, we allow you to uh, use a parenthetical notation to actually request that. So if you want the entries in a feed and you want just the media group in that, and in that media group you just want the media thumbnails, that's how you do it. You'd say entry, parentheses, media group, parentheses, media thumbnail. And this is only element level selection, so there's no attribute selection. All attributes and anything you select will always come along. And this was actually a simplification to make things a lot easier. Um, and it turns out that we have so few attributes, and they tend to be so small that it, it doesn't really significantly affect the size of things. Uh, here's a second example for the, the entry itself. You want the author's name that leaves everything else out, and you want the GMO pause out of the GORSS where it leaves everything else out. So it's pretty simple to, to specify what sub-elements you want. But there's one more thing we added, which is conditional filters. And this is based. Um, it's, it, well, it's, it's similar to XPath. It's a very strict subset of some of the XPath selection uh, and conditional filtering. So it lets you actually say that you want, in the first case here, only the thumbnail whose height URL is 144. And this will leave anything that doesn't match that will not get sent. So this is a great way to, to select a particular element out of an array of elements. Um, and another example is when you're selecting entries, when you're getting that feed of entries, suppose you only want those entries that were authored by Sam, and the server doesn't give you a way to query that, we can actually use a filter after the query to only get back the ones that had the name Sam. The important thing about this is that filters are not queries. So if you're doing a, a query on a feed, and you're asking for 100 results, and then you say you only want the entries whose, name was, whose author's name was Sam, and that only matched 10, you'll only get 10 back. Even if on the server there were maybe 100 out of 2,000 that matched. So it, it, it's a filter after the query matches. So the query matches the first 100, and then the filter gets applied and, and pairs that down. So it's very important to remember that. The other uh, thing to notice here is in the response, we actually wrap the response in a GD partial element, and we include the fields that you selected. And we'll see later. Um, at the, at the end of the talk, I'm going to talk about some of the, the new stuff we're working on after this, and, and this comes into play there. But it's also useful for, for parsers to know that you're getting a partial response and to know in that case that, for example, some of the, the entry fields that usually are required, like Atom ID is required, it's actually here, um, and Feed ID is required, and it's not here. Those elements are required, but they, they may not show up because you actually didn't select them in the, in the, in the partial. So this is actually not a valid feed, but it's a valid partial feed. So that's why that wrapper element exists. OK, so let's go ahead and use this in our Photo Shuffle application. It's pretty simple. Um, that, that source that we requested, we just add this fields equal 
Um, and here you see what I was saying before about how the JSON-C is actually based on the JSON-C names. It's not entry, it's albums. So you say, I want the albums, and I want their ID, title, their feed link, and that was links feed, not link with the rel where, you know, this long condition, right? It's much simpler in this case. You just want the feed link, um, and you want the uh, media thumbnails and nothing else. And those are the only things the application uses, so that's what we request. We just ask for what we actually want and leave everything else. And then the only other change we have to make is that we now have that wrapper element, that GD partial wrapper around things. So rather than having the feed be the top level, the wrapper's the top level, so you have to do data.feed.albums rather than data.albums. But otherwise, everything else stays the same. So how does this affect the size? In a pretty big way. We went from our original of 770 kilobytes down to, you know, I think it was 380-ish for the uh, JSON-C. Now we're down to, I, I think it was 70 kilobytes uncompressed in the partial because we got rid of all that other stuff we didn't want. Uh, even compressed, it's actually pretty good. It, it went from about 38 down to 10. So it's a factor of four there. Um, really, really makes a huge difference. And it affects the, the request time. Um, so it's, it takes about, it was about two seconds, a little over two, rather than taking um, almost four for the JSON and, and two and a half-ish for the JSON-C. So the request time's good, and the parse time is even better. There's, there's so much less data that it's, it's just a lot quicker. Part of the reason that the request time didn't drop as much as you'd expect is that, of course, there's a fixed amount of time that is going to happen between your round trip regardless. That's just your latency. And then also the server has to do some work so that um, that takes up some time. So the actual amount of time spent sending the data back and forth is smaller. But So the parse time is smaller. OK, so that was, uh, that was partial get. We're very excited about that. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is something uh, that actually came out a little bit ago, but some of you may not be familiar with, which is our eTag support. So you, you may have seen this, and you may not have. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with, with e-tags? Hopefully most of you. OK. OK, well, I'll, I'll go in a, a little bit on it. But um, again, I'm going to first do a little background into sort of why things are the way they are right now in our service, and then talk about um, what, what we're doing in the future. So our initial service was based on the HTTP 1.0 support for client-side caching, which it uses the uh, last modified and if modified sense. So when you're doing a conditional get, you want to say, you know, give me this feed or give me this entry if it hasn't changed since this time. Um, the way you get that, that time is by the last modified date on the response. So you'll get back a feed. One of the headers will be last modified. It will have this date. You record that. And then when you're doing your next request for that feed or entry, you send that along with it in a header in the if modified sense header. And then if it hasn't changed, the server will respond with a 304 not modified. So this is, this is pretty basic, HTTP 1.0. Um, it's pretty simple. It, you just use a date. You just send it up. It tells you if it changed. But unfortunately, there are some problems with it. The biggest problem is that it has one second granularity. So this was, was kind of a huge mistake, um, especially as things have gotten faster. It's pretty easy nowadays to actually make multiple updates within a second. So if you have, if your, um, your, your timestamp on your element, maybe, maybe you have millisecond, maybe you have nanosecond granularity in, in your back end. So that will change. But if it's within the same second, um, the, the client can actually think it has the newest version and not because it changed twice in the same second. So the, the client can make a request halfway through that second, get it back. It, it's pretty rare, but it does happen, especially at scale. So um, this is kind of a problem. There are some ways you can fix it. You can have the server delay the response until a second has elapsed. You could use dates in the future, except the spec doesn't allow it. So there's, there's, there's issues there. And another problem is that we're dealing with time, but at the same time, the server is the only valid source of that. So it's really, it's, it's a timestamp, but it's actually, it can't be used as a timestamp. You can't you know, do date computations. The server could change dates. You know, you can't use it to, to judge when things change. It's actually not useful as time. And you can't use it on the client as if, as if it was actually time. You have to actually send exactly what you got back. You can't, you know, if something is similar, you can't take it. You can't do less thans. It's, it, it has to be equal. So that's kind of a problem. 
Okay, so my my uh, slides had a little issue there. All right, so how do we fix this? Uh, HTTP 1.1 introduced something called e-tags, which some of you are familiar with, but many of you aren't. Um, they're pretty simpler. They're actually just an opaque quoted string. So rather than having a date that looks like a date, but you can't use it as a date, you have to just treat it as an opaque string. E-tags are an opaque string to start with. And they can be much smaller because of that. You can encode data in there. You can code a lot more than just timestamps. You can code whatever you want. You can do hashes. Um, they're just a string with two quotes. Um, very, very simple. There's one additional complication. They may be what's called strong or weak. The difference is that strong e tags can be used for conditional updates, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and weak e tags can only be used for conditional gets, not for updates. So here's a weak e tag. There's just a w slash before it. Um, nothing too exciting there. Just think of them as a peg of strings, and you'll be fine. The way it works is that a server will, uh, one point, HTTP 1.1 point one server will respond with an e tag header in the response, um, and our, our Google Data APIs will return that um, on our new versions as well on feed and entry requests. So here's an example response. You see the, uh, the e tag header, and then there's also two other things. So we actually also return the e tag at the feed level and at the entry level. So when you request a feed, we'll give you back the e tag for the feed itself, both in the header and on the element. And the reason it's on the element is in case you don't have access to the headers, it's easy to get to. Um, but we also give you it on each of the entries, and that's really useful because that way you can use that e tag for both conditional get of that entry itself and conditional update without having to go back and make a separate request for the entry. So just the feed gives you all you need. So um, how do we actually do our client side caching with this? So instead of using if modified sense, which is what we used for the last modified, we're going to use if not match. Um, Oops, I think that was out of order, but all right, so yeah, uh, I have a slide out of order. Sorry about that. Um, I'll go back to that in a second. Here's what it looks like with the if none match. So you send a, an if none match request with that um, e tag, either weak or strong. So in this example, it's for a feed, so it was weak. And then if it has not changed, the server will respond with a 304 not modified. And I'll go back to that. You can see the only uh, thing to really think about here is the request time. On a not modified, the server doesn't send you any data back. And in fact, backends can be quicker to respond with a not modified than with the full data. They don't have to go fetch everything. They can just see, oh, did the version change? No, OK, just respond with the 304, you're done. Things are much quicker. Um, and then on the client, for example, in the browser, the browser will just pull that data out of its local cache. So you don't have to worry about the request time. You don't have to worry about the bandwidth. There's no bandwidth used. Much, much nicer. Okay. So that was conditional get. But the other thing you can use e tags for, which you couldn't use the if modified sense for, was is for optimistic concurrency. So rather than using if none match, you use if match. And that lets you say, modify this, this document or this entry only if the e tag matches the one I'm going to send you. So here's an example. Um, we want to put a new version of some entry. Uh, we, we give it the URL, and in this case, well, it looks sort of like the, the old one, but in this case, there's actually no longer a version string at the end of it. It's just the entry ID, so it doesn't change between versions, which is very nice. And you just say if match, and you give it the strong e tag, not the weak e tag. And if nothing, if it, if it matched, if that e tag was OK, you get a 200 OK. You, you successfully changed that entry. If it didn't, you get a 412 precondition failed, and, and again, we'll send you back the new version of the entry so you know, you know it changed and you can get the new one. One other thing you can do with this that you couldn't do with the old system is use if match star. And what this does is it allows you to force an update even if someone else has changed that entry between. So this is actually um, kind of dangerous unless you're using uh, something I'm going to talk about at the end of the talk. But if you're just using a regular update, the problem with this is you'll overwrite anyone else's changes without, without um, keeping them in because you're putting an entire entry back. So, so use with caution. Okay. So we, we've seen uh, we've seen e tags now. We know what they are. How do we actually add add e tag support to our application? 
It's not very complicated. You just do nv equals 2, and you're done. And this is actually our versioning support, which, so who's familiar with the, the Google Data API's versioning support that was added? Okay, only a couple of you. So you can, you can go look at the docs, but basically we've been rolling out new versions of services, and the way we version them is using a, a version parameter v. In this case, the Picasso Web Albums API is on version 2, and version 2 includes etag support. So if you want etags, you just change to version 2, and there you are. Okay, so that was, um, that was e-tags, and now I'm going to talk about stuff that doesn't quite exist yet. So, so e-tags is already out. Uh, JSON-C is on Picasso Web Albums. Um, probably this week it will launch the, the final version. I'm actually using a, a sort of preview version of it that's in production, but it's, it's going to change a little bit. And then uh, YouTube is actually working on their JSON C support right now, so that'll be out soon. And, and we're going to keep rolling out more services to that. Uh, partial get will actually roll out a little bit faster than that. So um, as we roll that out, we'll, we'll let you know on, on the blogs and on code.google.com. So keep an eye out for that. But now I'm going to look at some stuff that's not quite there yet, so we'll be a little bit farther in the future. So the first thing is that JSON C is not a read only. Um, protocol. We actually meant for this to be both read and write. So unlike our existing JSON, where we convert on the server from XML to JSON, and then on the client convert from JSON back to XML and send back to XML, you can actually send back the JSON C. You don't need to translate back to XML for update. You can send it directly. And this supports all write operations, including batch um, and the regular puts and posts. And one nice thing is that the new browsers are actually adding capabilities for um, reading and, more importantly, writing JSON directly, which makes it much nicer. You can actually just call a browser method, um, json.stringify your data, and that'll give you a JSON string that can be sent to the client, to the, to the server. One other thing we're going to do is roll all this into our client library, so you won't actually have to do any of that. Excuse me. Um, another thing that this gives us is it lets us make the client libraries much, much smaller than they are right now. So currently, our client libraries actually contain a bunch of data model classes. So there's like a photo entry class and a media group class and, and all this. These are their JavaScript objects um, with functions and, and things to make life easier. Basically, because the existing format was so hard to work with, it's much, much nicer to call, um, you know, entry.getMediaGroup than it is to call entry.MediaDollarGroup and actually try to do the XML stuff yourself and all that. But of course, with JSON-C, it's much nicer. We don't need all that, so we can throw that out and just give you the bare-bones client library that does the interesting stuff, including you know, read-write-json, um, marshalling things on the wire. Very importantly, giving you authentication support, so giving you OAuth, OAuth support in the client library and also giving you cross-domain support. So that's the other big thing that our client library does. So you can actually do read-write requests cross-domain using our library, which is very nice. The other big thing is that, that, that partial document I was talking about, that GD partial, you can actually send those back to the server. So partial isn't just for Git. And this is, this is um, a huge part of our, our goal of making, making it so you only need to work with the data you really, really care about. So you can get a partial document, modify just that field you want to modify, and send that back to the server using patch instead of put. So it's really nice. And the other thing it gives you is that if match star I was talking about that was dangerous is now safe because you're only changing the field that you know the truth about. So it, do, it doesn't matter if other people change other fields. Like if the summary changed and all you're modifying is the title, you can actually do that now. You can just send the title. You can send a diff. Makes it much nicer. And the client only needs to store the stuff it actually cares about. So you only need to store those diffs. You don't need to store all of the entries. You don't need to store all these fields you don't know about or care about. You just store what you want. All right, so that's it. Um, that's, that's the new stuff we're, we're introducing. Um, if any of you have questions, please come up to the microphones, because this is being recorded so for the, for the recording, and so everyone can hear you. While you're waiting, I can, I can, I can shuffle some more stuff. <laughs> if it works. 
I needed a, a worker thread like they had this morning. There we go. All right. Okay. So, uh, uh, so are you going to uh, implement patch for XML too? Yes. So patch is going to be both XML and um, and JSON C based. Do support them? So the um, the existing JSON library supports cross-domain rights. We actually use um, some browser tricks to get data back and forth between a script running on our domain and the script running on your domain. So those two scripts communicate, and then the script running on our domain can actually do a regular XML HTTP request mm -hmm. with the data, and so that's how you get you get cross-domain. So it's you marshal it between domains. Thanks. And I, the, all the information on that should be on the code.google.com APIs GData site. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Charlie Wood from Spain Sync. Um, are all of these going to be supported across all of the product APIs, or are they sort of optional for each product to implement? Excellent question. So um, they actually are somewhat optional, although we're pushing very hard to get every single product to use them. The, the problem is that, especially for the JSON-C, we're actually customizing it, and, and I didn't really go into too much detail on this, but we're, we're customizing the output specifically for each product, so things are going to look like you'd expect. So a, a photo in Picasso Web looks like you'd expect JSON for photo to look, and in YouTube, a video is going to look like you'd expect a video to look. So that's, that's a bit more work um, to do. So it does take more time, and it, it does require extra effort on the part of our, our, um, our services. So we're pushing on them to, to get it done as quickly as, as they can. So. But if you guys want particular services to have this support, you know, go on their boards and ask for it, and that'll give them pressure to come to us and, and ask for help. So it'll be good. Um, are you going to support APIs for Google Reader anytime soon? For what? For Google Reader. Google Reader. I don't know of any plans to support any, but even if I did, I wouldn't know. So, um, yeah, no, I, I don't actually know. I don't know about that. Any other questions? Yeah, well, thank you guys for coming.